Please give it up for New York Times best-selling author, Mark Manson. This is a long way to walk. Still walking, still walking. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Oh, man. How is everybody? Are awake. This morning, everybody's kind of like, eh, what? Uh, my name is Mark Manson. Uh, I'm, I'm known for writing things, and uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here in Sharjah. This is actually the first event I've ever done in the Middle East, and um, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm blown away by the enthusiasm and uh, how, how excited everybody is at this event. So it's, it's very cool to be here. Um, how many people here are familiar with the Orange Book? It's almost everybody. How many people have read the Orange Book? Most of you, not everybody. Um, that's good. So for those of you who don't know, uh, the thing I'm known for is this extremely offensive title. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm the best-selling author of The Soul Art, Not Giving an F, uh, and also Everything is F, a book about hope. Um, before I was an author, I was actually a, uh, a blogger for about 10 years, and um, that's actually how I, I got my start and initially built my audience. Um, I run one of the largest personal development websites in the world, markmanson.net, gets over two million readers a month. Um, and the, the book has just been, it's been this incredible phenomenon. Uh, it's brought me all over the world, um, met people from all sorts of walks of life. It's been number one in 13 different countries. It's been uh, translated into over 50 languages. Uh, languages I didn't even know existed. Like it's, there's all sorts of crazy little languages all over the planet. Um, so it, it's really, it's really been uh, a dream come true in many ways, and I'm still kind of like pinching myself every now and then, uh, wondering how this happened. Uh, so what, what am, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight just about what I'm about, some of the main ideas of what I write about, uh, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about like why it seems these ideas are resonating so much in the world today. So, I sometimes describe myself, like the, the way I introduce myself in interviews, or sometimes the way the interviewers introduce me is, I'm kind of the anti-self-help guru. Or, or as I put it, um, I write self-help for people who hate self-help. It's kind of it's self-help without all the, the fluffy nonsense that comes along with it. And here, here are some of the main things that I, I preach, or I, or I teach to people. First one is, you are not special. Now I know that everybody's mother in here told them that you know, you're, you're wonderful and unique and you're gonna do amazing things. Um, and I'm not saying your mother lied to you, but she's a little biased. <laughs> because ultimately, most of what we do in our life is very mundane, it's very repetitive, uh, and most of us have the same experiences. We, the, the funny thing about the human mind is that we, we kind of trick ourselves into thinking that our successes and our failures are unique to us, that nobody could understand what we're going through, that nobody gets what it is, it's like to be us. But the funny thing is that actually anything that you've gone through, millions and millions of people around the world are either going through the same thing or they've gone through the same thing in the past. There is very little human experience that is, that is truly unique. Uh, and so it's, you can think of it as kind of a message of, of get over yourself. You know, we're all, we're all flawed human beings. And I think this is a particularly important message, especially in this day and age, because if you look at psychological research, it's very much people who do awful things uh, the main reason they do it is that they feel a sense of entitlement. They feel a sense that they are unique, that the rules should be changed for them. And if you look throughout human history, you see all sorts of examples of this. You know, so the Nazis, they did all the awful things because they thought they were uniquely special, that they were a special race of human being. 
Uh, if you look at like Genghis Khan and all the, the, the massacres that he committed, he did it because he thought he was uniquely privileged to rule the entire world. If you look at Thanos, he had a very deluded belief that he had the right to determine the fate of the universe. You're not special, Thanos. So instead of preaching the extraordinary and encouraging people to go do something amazing and be different, the point I always try to make is that it's not about doing something extraordinary, it's about doing ordinary things extremely well. Because ultimately that's what gets you where you want to be, is doing the mundane stuff very, very well and doing it consistently over a long period of time. The other thing I talk about a lot is I say that motivation is overrated. A lot of people think that, that if you want to change your life or if you want to do something great or amazing, uh, you, man, you just got to get motivated. And one of the things I talk about is that motivation is not the cause of action, it's actually the result of action. Motivation is the side effect of getting your emotional life in order. There's a picture that I love. Motivation. Just remember, every corpse on Mount Everest was once an extremely motivated person. No, not funny here? All right. Uh, <laughs> it's funny, some countries, this, people just die laughing. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> Motivation, ultimately, if you, I, I think motivation is not the fundamental question. The fundamental question is finding something important and meaningful in your life. Because if you find something that gives your life a sense of meaning and purpose, then you don't have to worry about motivation. The motivation solves itself. So instead of focusing on motivation, I ask people, to find the few things in their life that matters, that, that, that they find, they derive the most meaning from. And the last thing, don't pursue happiness. This one gets me into a lot of trouble at my, uh, in my home country. Because part of American, a huge part of American culture is this pursuit of happiness. It's, it's even written into one of our founding documents. You know, everybody has the right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And so, when I'm, in front of, when I'm in front of American audiences, you know, people kind of bristle and start feeling weird when I say this. But it's, the funny thing about happiness is that the more you chase it, the further away it gets from you. The more you, you reach and try to hold on to it, the more it kind of falls through your fingers. And so I say, don't pursue happiness, pursue pain. And pain and struggle has kind of become the cornerstone of uh, my philosophy or everything that I talk about. Because if you pursue pain and get good at managing pain, the happiness will happen as a side effect. So why pain? Well, there's a few reasons. One is that we need the struggle to give life a sense of meaning for ourselves. Like if you ask yourself, like who are Man, that kid's really not happy. <laughs> you know what's really funny? Because this part of my talk, I use an example of a really upset kid, and, uh, and it just so happens that there's a really upset kid right now. Um, <laughs> so let me ask you this. Who are the most miserable people on the planet? The, like the worst people to be around? I'm just getting, well, not, not kids, not all kids. Not all kids. The, the answer, the normal answer, uh, is is uh, kids who get everything they want. Like we all know, we all know that child. Maybe it's a family member or kid of a friend. That that kid that's just spoiled rotten and that is just given everything they want when they want it, and they are unbearable to be around. And the reason this is is because. The, the way our, our minds work is that our mind is always assigning value to, to things in our life. We're always assigning value to our experiences and, uh, and things that happen to us. And a huge part of how our mind determines value is 
by looking at how much we sacrificed or struggled for that particular experience. So if somebody comes and, I don't know, just gives you a car, I mean, obviously you'd be happy and you would value that car. But if you worked and saved money for five years, dreaming about this car, working at overtime, you know, not going out on weekends, putting money in the bank to buy that car, suddenly that car has a whole new significance for you. You'll take way more care of it, you'll be way more emotionally attached to it, and it'll have a lot more meaning for you because it will represent this period of your life in which you sacrifice for it. And so the reason that spoiled kids are kind of like the worst humans on earth is that by giving them everything they want, their parents actually rob them of the ability to determine what is valuable and what is not. When everything is just given to you, you are not, you're not able to find meaning, uh, find meaning through the experience that was required to get it. And I'll be, I'll be talking later on in the talk about how I think one of the ways that our technology is affecting us uh, is it's turning us all into spoiled little kids. Everything is coming too immediately and too easy without struggle and therefore uh, everything feels more meaningless. Another reason why I focus on pain is that our ability to withstand pain is what determines our success. I'm going to be talking about that in a minute. And pain and sacrifice is ultimately necessary to find happiness. So is anybody, anybody here a runner? All right, all three of you, okay. <laughs> I ran once, uh, didn't, didn't go very well. Uh, now, now I prefer to just sit and write things. But I use an example in my book of, if you take like a marathon, like if, you, if we pretend somebody came in here with a gun and said, okay, all you go out to the street and run 45 kilometers. That, that would be a pretty awful experience and we would, we would suffer together, but we would suffer through it intensely. But then imagine another scenario where you wake up one morning, you're like, you know what? I've always wanted to run a marathon. You find a coach, you find a trainer, you go out, you buy, buy some nice shoes, you get an exercise program going, you work really, really hard for six or eight months, you plan for the race, you go to the race, the, your family is there, your friends are there, they're cheering you on, you get to the finish line, they hand you a medal, like it's this great, great, uh, victorious experience. That would be one of the most, probably one of the most powerful experiences of your life. And what's funny about these two scenarios is that you're enduring the exact same amount of pain. You're still run, you're running the exact same distance. You're going the same, spending roughly the same amount of time suffering. Yet one is this horrible, horrible experience that will probably traumatize you, and then the other one is actually one of the, an experience that you would be proud of for the rest of your, rest of your life. So this, this brings up a very interesting point about pain, and it's that the experience itself is not what determines suffering. It's the meaning that we create around the experience. It's, it's ultimately whether we suffer from something or not, is determined by the narratives that we create in our minds to explain that experience. And this is really important because ultimately, we're always choosing what narratives we use to explain our experiences. We are, in every moment, we are, we are determining the meaning of our experiences and of our pain. And when we feel as though we have, we have chosen the struggle in a certain way, that's what gives our lives a sense of meaning. And so this choice is always in front of us at every moment. Sometimes it's very hard to see. Sometimes we don't want to accept that we have that choice. But it's always there. Usually around this point somebody says, well screw you Mark, I didn't choose my problems. You don't understand. You don't know what I've been through. I'm like, well yeah. I don't. Uh, but what's important is that 
even if you didn't choose your specific problem, you have chosen, you have made choices that have led up to this, the context of the problem. I'll use an example uh, from my own life. So my, my mother-in-law, bless her heart, love her very much. Um, so so my, my wife is Brazilian and her family, is, Brazilian is super Catholic and it's, they, we have these very intense Christmases. Uh, where the whole extended family gets together and you spend the whole day eating and it's it's a good time. And uh, but the problem is is that in my wife's family, you know, there's that one person. I feel like every family has that one person that you're kind of well, nobody likes, but you know, they're family, so you st they still got to come over, you still got to invite them. And it's like, all right, well, you just kind of deal with them. So my wife's family uh, they have this person and this person would come to Christmas and for years and years and years she would kind of ruin everything she would start fights with people she would get drunk and yell at people and uh, it started to become a problem and so my wife went to her mother and she said she said look you're choosing to invite her you need to you need to stop inviting her and my mother-in-law said but it's, I can't do anything. I have, no, I have no choice. My wife said, of course you have a choice. Just tell her not to come. And my mother-in-law said, no, but it's, it's Christmas. You have to invite family. So my wife said, well, you're choosing to believe that on Christmas you have to invite your family, so you are still, in a sense, choosing to invite this person. To which my mother-in-law said, but everybody invites their family. I didn't decide that you have to invite your family. It's not my fault. To which my wife said, well, you're choosing to believe that everybody invites you. You get the point. Uh, nothing was solved that day. The family member still comes to Christmas. But I think the point is true. Is that even if, even if she didn't choose the problems that were happening at these family events, she was choosing to put herself in the context of those problems. There was a whole string of choices that led her into allowing those problems to exist. Another uh, objection I often get is, but, but wait, what if I'm a legit victim? What if I get hit by a car? What if I get cancer? What if somebody close to me dies? I didn't choose that. But still, even though you don't choose your loss in life, you get to choose what your life means. And when you choose what your loss means, it grants you power over it. There's this really cool new area of psychology that's, that's called post-traumatic growth. And you know, everybody's heard of PTSD and, and how trauma messes us up, but what's, what's fascinating is that people who experience traumatic events, really only a, a small minority of them actually suffer from things like PTSD. What actually many more of them experience is, is what's becoming known as post-traumatic growth. It's people who go through these dark and painful periods of their life and they, it allows them to reevaluate what they're choosing to care about, what, what's important to them, and then they actually come out of it a much better person. It was interesting when I was doing, uh, when I was pitching the idea for Subtle Art to publishers in New York, I was taking all these meetings and uh, meeting with editors and, and at, at all these different companies. And it was funny because a lot of these editors just, they didn't, they didn't get it at all. Uh, they, thought I, they thought I wanted to just, they thought I basically just wanted to like write a Tony Robbins book with the F word on the cover, you know? And they're like, sounds great, let's do it. And I was like, no, 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 no. There's a, there's a philosophy behind this. And uh, as we were going through the, as we were meeting with all these different publishers, I was starting to get frustrated. And then I remember I went into HarperCollins and I met, my editor, Luke Dempsey, for the first time, and he walked into the room, and he put my proposal, he put the proposal on the table, and he said, I'm a cancer survivor, it's the best thing that ever happened to me, and I'm gonna publish your book. And from that moment, I was like, he gets it. He gets it, I don't care 
what the money is, what the numbers are, like he's the only one who gets it. This brings us to the most important question of your life. So if we're always if we're always experiencing problems and always struggling and we're always choosing the meaning around our problems and how we interpret our problems, then that ultimately leads us to the most important question in our lives, which is what struggles do you want in your lives? Because no matter what you do, you're going to have pain and setbacks and challenges. If you try to live a comfortable life that's always easy, that's going to be a challenge and a struggle. If you try to live a life that is uh, isolated and cut off from everybody, that is going to be full of challenge and setbacks. If you try to be connected to everybody and be very open and social, that is going to have challenges and setbacks. Everything you can ever desire requires challenge and setbacks. So the question becomes, not what success do you want, but what challenges and setbacks do you want? Because ultimately that determines more about who you are. Because like, let's be honest, everybody, we all want the same things. Everybody in this room wants the same things. We all want to be successful. We all like money. We all want to have good relationships. We all want to be happy. I mean, it's boring, right? There's nothing different about that. What makes each person in here unique and individual is what pain we like, is what the, the certain way that we like to suffer. The thing that makes you good at your job and makes other people not good at it is that you have found ways to deal with those challenges extremely well. Because to get good at anything, we have to love the associated pain. And I think this is what most self-help and success advice kind of misses, is everybody's focused on the goal, on the result. Oh, you want to make a million dollars. All right, do X, Y, Z. Nobody stops and thinks about, do you want the sacrifices required to make a million dollars? Do you want the, the pain that's associated with a high-powered career? Do you want to have to give up free time and relationships to, do, to achieve certain goals? I didn't always want to be an author. I actually started writing, I guess, pretty late. I didn't start writing until, uh, seriously until I was like 26 or 27. Originally, I wanted to be a musician. And I even went to music school. I studied jazz guitar, uh, which sounds, probably sounds like just a bunch of hippies sitting around smoking cigarettes. But uh, <laughs> music school is actually very intense. Has anybody here seen the movie Whiplash? It's an amazing film. If you haven't seen it, absolutely go see it. Music school is no joke. Uh, the program that I entered had a 13% graduation rate. 87% of people who, who got accepted to the program never finished it. And I made it one year. And I remember I was practicing guitar probably six to seven hours a day. I was going to classes three to four hours a day playing in ensembles and bands. And, uh, and I remember about eight or nine months into it, I was just disgusted with guitar. I, like, I didn't want to see a guitar. I didn't want to touch a guitar. I didn't want to hear music. I just wanted to go be, be somewhere silent and alone and like put my hand in a bucket of ice because I was so sick of playing. And I remember I went into a guitar lesson one day and I tried to play something and my teacher just looked at me and he said, stop. You know what your problem is? And I was like, what? Said, you just don't practice enough. I was like, God, <laughs> I'm done. I'm done with this. And uh, I remember there was this one guy in our program. His name was Chris McQueen. And he was like the one guy in the program. We all knew, OK, Chris is going to make it. You know, we're probably screwed, but Chris is going to make it. And, uh, and I, I, I kind of reached this desperate point, and I saw Chris, Chris sitting alone at lunch one day in the cafeteria, and I was like, I went and sat across from him, and I was like, hey man, can I, can I just ask you a few questions? 
Because I, I was like, clearly this guy knows something I don't. And I need to find out what that is. And so I sat down with him and I started asking him all these questions. You know, like, what's your morning routine like? What's your practice schedule? Um, how, do you, how do you prioritize the songs that you work on? Uh, how do you stay motivated uh, to, to keep working through, keep practicing through all the problems? And uh, he just kind of looked at me and gave me like the most blase, boring answers. He didn't tell me anything, really. Everything, everything he said was very obvious, and I, was, and I just realized that he had no idea what I was talking about. So I was like, okay, I think I'm, I'm going to quit music school. And so I quit music school, and uh, about six or seven years later, I started a website. And this was back in like 2008, 2009. And back in 2008, 2009, if you had a website and you wanted people to come to your website, uh, you had the blog. Blogs were like the cool new thing in 2008. And so I was like, all right, I'll, I'll start this blog thing. So I started blogging and uh, I thought it was fun. I'm like, this is cool. It's a nice way to like pretend like I'm working on my business even though I'm just writing fun stuff. And, uh, and, I, and I started writing these huge posts that were like 10, 20 pages long. And sure enough, I started getting a lot of traffic and within a couple of years, uh, my business started making money and I'm like, sweet. I'm building an internet business. And I remember after a few years, I started going to these conferences for internet business conferences. And I'd be hanging out outside the exhibit room and, and people started coming up to me and they were like, hey man, can I, can I ask you some questions? Like, I really like your blog, but can I ask for some advice? And I was like, yeah, sure. And they're like, what's your morning routine like? What's your writing schedule? And I found myself giving the same exact boring answers that Chris McQueen gave me. I don't have a writing routine. <laughs> I don't get up early. <laughs> like, who gets up early? Oh, you do? Okay. And these people would be so disappointed because they thought I knew something that they didn't. And what I realized, <laughs> it took me a long time to figure this out, but Chris McQueen loves sitting in a room by himself playing the same song for six hours until he gets it perfect. That made me miserable. I couldn't, I didn't, that was not my pain. I did not enjoy that pain. He enjoyed it. And that's why he has two Grammys today and I haven't touched a guitar in five years. I love rewriting the same paragraph seven different times. It's just fun to me to just keep going over it over and over. Most people hate that. Most people drive them absolutely crazy. That's why I'm a writer and a lot of people aren't. It's ultimately, I think as individuals, we're, we're each well adapted to some sort of pain in our lives. There's, some sort, there's something that we are all able to tolerate or bear that most other people are not. And that is our greatest advantage in the world. That is ultimately what determines where our successes come from, is what pain do we enjoy sustaining. I've started doing a lot of kind of corporate events, and I included this slide to also make a point about leadership, which is that this isn't just about us. It's not just about getting us to, to be more successful or, or be happier in our lives. The willingness to suffer is also the cornerstone of leadership. Because it's, it's easy to, like if you're a leader or if you have people who work for you, it's easy to motivate them. Like this is why motivation's overrated. It's easy to motivate people. I could, I could go to my team tonight and be like, hey guys, do this by next week or you're fired. Boom, motivated. They're gonna be miserable, and they're probably gonna make me miserable, but they'll be motivated. But if I'm able to go to my team and I'm able to say, hey guys, this is our mission. This is how, this is what needs to happen in the world. And I'm gonna work long hours, 
I'm going to get on a plane, go to Dubai for, for two days, and then immediately get back on a plane and come back and take a meeting the next morning because I believe in this stuff. And this is important to me. And I want to invite you to come along with me. When they see you suffering first, then it gives them the courage and the willingness to suffer for the same cause. And this is the essence of, of good leadership, is the willingness to go first. So one thing I get asked all the time in interviews is, <laughs> I, I always find it kind of funny, like I, I, I end up, I do interviews with like newspapers and stuff and they're like, so why do people buy your books? <laughs> like you seem like a pretty dark dude. Uh, why is everybody buying this stuff? And I've actually been thinking about that a lot lately. Like why, why is this, I've been doing this professionally for, for over 10 years now, but it really, just in the last two or three, it's exploded and it's become this, this worldwide phenomenon. Uh, and I've come to a few conclusions. I think one is just the internet has made people very skeptical and untrusting of the world. The problem with having access to information about everything is that you discover how everything is flawed. Everything that you could possibly put your hope in has problems. Everything's a little bit corrupted, everything's a little bit flimsy, not going the way it should go. And that's, that's incredibly disappointing to people. And I think that's why there's so much widespread pessimism in the world today. And I think when people are skeptical and untrusting, when you lead with pain, it immediately, it's like a breath of fresh air to people. You know, if I come to people and I say, hey, I can teach you how to be a millionaire, just do these three easy steps, blah, blah, blah. You know, in the 21st century, people hear that and they immediately think you're lying to them. But if you come to people and you're like, hey, life sucks, I can help you deal with it. <laughs> They're like, hey, I can trust this guy. <laughs> So I, I, I feel like there's like just this surging demand for this, this more pessimistic take on, on human psychology. I also think, to kind of refer to the, the spoiled children example, I think getting what we want all the time makes us a little bit cynical. There's something to be said, I mean how many people here have had the experience of wanting something really bad, and then as soon as you get it, you don't want it anymore. All the time, right? There's something about desiring something in your life that is more satisfying than actually having it. Because once you get it, you're like, oh crap, I have to like do work to keep this thing. <laughs> this, isn't, this was fun for a while, but now, now this is stressful. And I think, you know, the more and more our world enables us to get what we want quicker, easier, faster, the more we kind of, the more dis of that s simple disappointment that we feel. Like, oh man, I thought this was really going to change things for me. But it's actually, it's just another, it's another burden. And so, when I come with a message of like, look, problems never end. Improving your life, there's, there's no end. You're never gonna solve all the problems in your life because every solution to one problem simply creates the next problem and it's an endless cycle. And so the best thing you can hope for is to simply have better problems. To trade in one terrible problem for a less terrible problem. And I think that in our, in our day and age where there's so much instant gratification, I think that resonates with people. And then the last point I'll make is, I just, I don't think all the positivity stuff, I just don't think it worked. If you look at the evidence, you know, the, the classic positivity self-help has been around, at least in the US, it's been around for about 100 years now. And if you look at, at data on depression, anxiety, suicide, drug usage, they're all steadily on the rise. 
and have been for decades and decades and decades. There's something about the pleasure and convenience of the modern world that makes meaning, a, creating meaning in our lives a more difficult conversation. I think one way I describe it in my new book is I say that, that technology, technology offered a bargain that we weren't expecting, which is that we, trade in, we traded in uh, physical struggle for existential struggle or psychological struggle. And yes, that is a better problem to have, but it's still a problem. Uh, so as a result, I often feel like a, a, a guy just standing on an island by himself shouting a lot of this stuff. And, and it's, it's funny because all the conventional media and the conventional uh, self-help industry, I, I think I, I sound like this lone crazy person in the corner, but then when I come out to events like this and I get out in the world and it, it's just, it's resonating with millions and millions of people. And I think it's just, people are intuitively feeling the sense that less is more. In the 21st century, less is becoming more. We need to focus on fewer things and do them very, very well. In an age full of distraction, full of people constantly bouncing between their phone and a television and six things that were going on that day, it's the ability to block things out and really narrow your focus and get good at one thing, I think it's becoming more of an advantage than ever before. I think focusing on fewer people and really caring about them is more important than ever before. Uh, you know, social media, it's easy to criticize social media. I think the original intention behind social media was great connect the world, expose people to each other. There is value in that. But ultimately, having a large quantity of connections is not a replacement for having a few high quality connections. And I think more of an emphasis needs to be put back on having that small amount of high quality connections. And then finally, focus on less information of higher relevance. And I would also say of higher quality. Uh, I think when I think back to like the 1990s, there was this very idealistic vision of like, if we create the internet, then everybody will put all the information online and uh, everybody will figure out what's true and right and then we'll all agree and be happy together. And that totally did not happen <laughs> at all. In fact, it's the opposite is happening. And I think what we forgot is that most information is garbage. <laughs> most of it is, is it's nonsense. It's, it's biased, it's self-serving, it's, it's untrue. And so I think one of the most important skills of the 21st century is developing an ability to cut through noise and uh, what I call uh, information of poor nutritious value. Basically information that is like empty calories uh, of information and get to uh, a few sources of highly relevant, highly useful information. So, to sum everything up, key takeaways, you're always choosing, so choose your problems wisely. Your problems determine the quality of your life, not your successes. A good life is about good problems. And you're never going to get rid of problems, so you better hope for the good problems. Meaning matters, not happiness. Doing less produces more. Mark Manson is incredibly handsome and a brilliant speaker. Oh, wow, thank you guys. I have no idea how that got up there. But, you know, I'm not going to argue. Buy my books. <laughs> Thank you. Give it up for Mark Manson one more time. How insightful was that? Mark, again, welcome to the UAE. Thank you for being here. I believe Mark is catching a flight at 3 a.m. Yep. <laughs> He's a busy guy, so we're very lucky to have him here today. Uh, Mark, all of us fans of your books, there is one thing that I really enjoyed about your book, one thing in particular, it was the feedback loop. Is that something you can unpack for us here today? Because I think this is something that people can take forward with them. Sure. 
So, in, in chapter one of Subtle Art, I have this concept that I call the feedback loop from, can I, can I say that here? They told me I can't curse. Yeah, we told <laughs> Let's keep it PG. Okay, they told me, they were like, you can't curse here. I'm like, okay, I, I could do that. All right, so feedback loop, the, the evil feedback loop, we'll call it that. Uh, so we have this funny tendency as humans that when we, we'll start getting anxious and then we'll start judging ourselves for our own anxiety. So, so we'll be anxious and that's bad enough, but then we're like, God, you're such an idiot. Why are you anxious all the time? And so now we're angry that we're anxious. And then maybe if we have a little bit more self-awareness, we realize that we're being angry and, and mean to ourselves. And so we're like, oh God, there you go again, being, being so mean to yourself. Stop judging yourself. And so now we're angry about being angry about being anxious. And this, this spiral just continues forever. And so the only way to get out of that is to just let yourself be anxious or let yourself be angry. It's to basically stop judging your own emotions. Because whenever you judge your own emotion, you, you multiply it. Uh, so yeah, that's how you get out. I like that answer. So here's the thing though, because as of recent, because we've all been following these positivity is the way forward like you were speaking about we've kind of been fed a lot of rubbish when it comes to that stuff we follow instagram accounts that have these inspirational quotes we've pretty much been programmed to think positively how do we now anyone sitting here tonight that is thinking hang on i like the way mark's thinking i want to think that way how do we reprogram ourselves now to think the way you think well i i think it's it's understanding I think we all develop a little bit of an allergic reaction to negativity. I know that, you know, in, in, in my country's culture, we definitely have this, like I speak to crowds and they're like, I really like the ideas, but do you have to be so negative? And I'm like, yes, yes I do. This is the whole point, <laughs> is that you get comfortable with the negativity. And so, you know, what I would encourage people is to, is to not shy away from maybe some of the, the more negative aspects. You know, one thing I definitely believe about life is that Anything really positive has, has subtle and, and non-obvious negative aspects to it. So the greatest success or the greatest happiness in your life, it, there are going to be costs that are not immediately obvious. And same thing with negative experiences. The, like the biggest pains in your life have very subtle and non-obvious benefits that sometimes it takes a year, two years, 10 years to become apparent. And so just be slow to judgment about what is positive and negative and, and simply try to be comfortable with both. So in your journey, I mean, you told us your story of wanting to be a musician, then you kind of never wanted to be an author, but it happened for you through blogging. How much pressure, because I know I, I'm really guilty for this, I weigh time as such a pressure. I'm like, I'm 28 years old, I should be doing this, I should be doing that. How did you deal with that through your journey, you know, putting time as a value on your career? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not much of one to talk because I sold like 10 million books by 35. <laughs> so, of course you did, <laughs> as you do. Um, but I will say this, I will say this. Um, I have a friend who told me a story that was really incredible. Like, I think, again, as a, there's a little bit of an ageism that happens in our cultures, which is uh, that, you know, by 40, your life's almost over, and, and 50, like, oh, forget it, you know? And it's, and obviously it's not true. And if you look at great, brilliant figures, they, they tend to do their best work into their 40s and 50s and even 60s. And I remember um, a friend of mine told me a story once. He said that his grandmother, uh, his grandfather passed away when his grandmother was about 60 years old. And she became very depressed and was grieving a lot. And so one of the things that she did uh, to help her during that time is she started taking piano lessons and started learning like little basic piano tunes. And a couple years went by and she kept taking piano lessons and just kept playing and playing. And people came to her and they're like, you know, it's, it's been a few years now, like you, you can stop with the piano. And she's like, no, I like it. And what's interesting is that she lived to be into her, well into her 90s. And so by the time she was 90 years old, she was as good as a professional piano player. 
And so people would hear her play piano at age 90 and they're like, wow, you must have been a concert musician. And she's like, no, I, I started playing when I was 60. So life is very long, very long. And we, I think it's, it's very dangerous to, to have a skewed perception of, of how much time we have left because we have tons of time. And, and the only thing stopping us from using that time is our own attitudes. Agreed, agreed. Yeah, round of applause for that, I like that. Um, something that you refer to as like a superhero uh, is the Disappointment Panda. <laughs> for anyone who hasn't heard of the Disappointment Panda, Mark, could you kind of just unpack that for us right now, because this is to stick with you for life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, th this, is, this is a peek into my own twisted mind. Um, I invented a superhero in my book. I named him Disappointment Panda. Uh, he's very fat and he wears a sombrero. I don't know why. Uh, and his superpower is that he tells people truths that they don't want to hear. And so he goes door to door and he knocks on the door and the person comes to the door and uh, they say, who are you? And he just says, making more money won't make your kids appreciate you more. And then he like, says goodbye and walks to the next house. And, uh, and so his whole existence, it, it's not only is it a superpower, but it's a curse. Because he, he, has, to, he has to bear the burden of, of disappointing every single person that he meets uh, by giving them the truth that they don't want to hear. It's a, it's a tough existence. Um, I think it'll be the next Avengers movie, personally. <laughs> I hope so, I hope so. Uh, last question, Mark, I would love to know, and I'm sure loads of people here would love to know. Where does Mark Manson look for inspiration? People look to you, they look up to you, they follow your ethos. Where do you look for inspiration yourself? Oh, man. So many places. Um, I'd say the biggest one is I just, I read tons and tons of books. Um, and, I, and I read very widely, like I don't, I don't just stick to nonfiction or self-help, like I, I like to read about science and I like to read literature and I like to read books from different cultures and, and it, because you never know where that spark of inspiration is going to come from. Uh, I was just in Japan a couple months ago and I discovered a Jap uh, Japanese author and I was like, this is crazy, this is so good. Uh, so it's, I just, I just try to stay curious, really. Well, round of applause for Mark Madison. Thank you so much for being here in the UAE in Sharjah tonight. Mark's books are here as well, right? Yeah. Yeah? You're doing a signing? So, there's gonna be a signing. Uh, I think we're gonna do some audience Q&A. And, uh, and then after the talk, if any of you want to get a book signed, get a picture, uh, talk to me for a little bit. I'm going to be doing a signing at my Arabic publisher's booth. Um, they're called um, Dar Al Tanwir. There we go. H4, Hall 4, H3. Dar Al Tanwir. I'll, and I'll see you there. It'll be about 15 minutes after the talk wraps up. Yeah. Okay, so shall we do some audience Q&A? Let's do it. Yeah, Any, anyone got questions for Mark? Hey, Mark. Hey. You see my face now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. It was great uh, speech. I'm so happy to. Uh, can you? Today. Sorry. Can you? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Better. First of all, I'm Ahmed from Palestine, and I was so happy to attend this speech. Uh, I just have two questions. The first one: Just tell me how to not think about being unique, and how will you move in life without thinking that you are unique in this world among this these billions, and you have to do something that made you out of this of the crowd okay this is the first question the second one uh, can you uh, like spot these points that you have talked about I, I see new perception in uh, new perceptions in your book so how did you apply these perceptions to to stay wherever you are now and to have this kind of success yeah I think this will be very beneficial to us thanks absolutely it's it's a good question. Uh, I actually went through a little bit of an experience, it, it was kind of ironic, after Subtle Art became so successful, there was a lot of temptation for me to, uh, I guess, fill my ego up a little bit, start thinking I was 
this special human who was deserved all these special things. Uh, there was a lot of temptation to kind of stop writing out of curiosity and write for money because a lot of money started to get offered to me. Um, and so I had to, I went through a little bit of a, a dark period for about a, six months where I actually, I needed to take my own advice, which is I needed to sit down, figure out my own values. What is my metric for success? How am I defining success for myself? Uh, what, is, what is most important to me? Uh, and what are the simple daily things that I need to do to, to live that out? Um, and, and just block out, you know, all of the, the hype and excitement that came with, with the success. And that was, it was really hard to do, but I feel like I was eventually able to do, to do it. I will say this, the easiest thing for me to do would have been to simply just write another book exactly like Subtle Art. That's pretty much what everybody wanted me to do. Uh, and it would have been easy and I would have made a lot of money, but it just, it felt, it didn't feel right. It felt like I was compromising my own values, and so um, I scrapped a couple a couple book ideas, and I, I just I went back to my fundamental uh, starting point, which is what what am I curious about in the world? What what does the world need to hear that 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 I want to be able to say? And, and that was the starting point for my second book. And I I wrote the second book understanding that a large percentage of people who love subtle art were not going to like the second book. And doing that was extremely difficult for me, uh, but I think in the long run it's worthwhile. So I hope that answers your question. Anyone else have a question? Oh, about not being trying to be. So I think there's a lot of pressure put on all of us to stand out and be unique all the time. And look, there's nothing wrong with standing out or being different. Uh, but I think it's also important that the problem emerges with, is when you start thinking that your differences are somehow better or, or special in some way. And, uh, and so the way you protect against that is to, is to just understand that it's, you know, there's whatever you experience, thousands, millions of other people are going through the same thing or something worse or something similar. Uh, you know, it, it really comes back to empathy, honestly. It's just being able to empathize with a wide variety of people and understand that your struggle or your success is not that special. And people say to me all the time, like, oh, easy for you to say, you sold eight million books. And I'm like, well, yeah, but, I mean, there's J.K. Rowling and Stephen King, like, really, like, there's always some comparison to make that, will make you feel like crap. So, uh, so I would rather just not make comparisons. Thank you, thank you for your question. Question number two. Lady in the black. There we go. Hi Mark, uh, my name is Lubna Hamdan and I'm the editor of Arabian Business Magazine. I've been chasing you for an interview for ages. <laughs> So it's great to see you live today. Um, my first question is, you know, you're, you're saying that positive doesn't work as well anymore and we need more, uh, we need to deal with the negative stuff more. Um, so do you think the, the Tony Robbins of this world will kind of disappear? Um, and the second question is, um, people get offended so easily nowadays. Um, how do we deal with that, especially in this part of the world? Yeah. Uh, so both good questions. I don't, I don't think the Tony Robbins version of self-help is going to go away. I just think it's going to become less prominent and less, less part of the culture. I think, I think something has fundamentally shift, shifted in popular culture. Um, and and, and I, I think these newer views are going to take more precedence. Uh, to deal with people being offended all the time, it's it's interesting. Well, one because of the language I use, I've been getting I've been offending people for a long, long time. <laughs> uh, so I'm a little bit desensitized to it. But it's de definitely in the United States in just the last two or three years, it's becoming a real a real issue of people just constantly being upset. And for me, 
I, whoa, we're getting feedback somewhere. Um, for me, it's just, I, I believe strongly that sometimes the most valuable things you can hear in life are upsetting. You know, when I think back to the most important things people have said to me, probably like 75% of them, I got really upset when they said it. You know, it's like, that's not true, you don't understand. And then two days later, I'm like, oh crap, they were right. Um, so we need that. And, and one of the points that I make in my work is that change is by definition uh, painful. Change is by definition, by definition we will resist change. We will resist hearing the things that we need to hear. And so there needs to be an ability to hear things that we need to hear. Uh, to let that anger come and understand that it's not that important. It's not as important as the, the message. Uh, so yeah, I'm all for offending people. <laughs> Hi Mark, how are you? Hello. So nice to see you today. So you talked about the feedback loop from a hell. Yeah. What if you are trying all the time not to feel depressed because you are depressed and not to feel anger, angry because you are, but you're not getting out of that loop? Sorry, say that last part again? Yeah, what you, you keep trying not to feel anxious because you are anxious and not to feel yeah. angry because you are angry, but you're not able to get out of this loop. Yeah. So what do you do then? I mean, it, it's, it's one of those things that it's very easy to say, but it's incredibly hard to do, which is the way you get out of the loop is you just let yourself be depressed. It's like, okay, I'm depressed. Let's see how long this lasts. <laughs> I mean, it sounds so simple, but I understand. It's incredibly difficult. But it's, it's real, the, the problem, the key is letting go of that judgment. We all get depressed. Every single person in this room has either been depressed before or will be depressed at some point in their life. There's nothing unique or special about depression. And so there's no reason to judge yourself for it. Depression is your mind telling, is, it's your mind. It, it, like imagine this, if you got the flu, you wouldn't be like, God, why do I have the flu? Oh, I'm such an idiot for having the flu. I should be healthy. Why am I not healthy? You know, we don't do that. People understand, oh, you have the flu. Go take a week off. Let yourself have it. You know, it needs to be the same with, these, with depression and anxiety. It's like, oh, you've got depression. Okay, you know, take your time. Thank you. Thank you for your question. It's quarter to nine, Mark. Time for one more question? Let's do one more. One more? Okay. Last question. <laughs> Sorry. There are so many. We'll just go with the mic closest to, please. Thank you. Hello. Very nice talk. Um, one honest confession, I've not read your books as yet. I just Sorry, can you pull the mic closer? I have not oh, read you. your book, um, but after hearing of philosophy, I have one question. Okay. I'm a little confused. Your philosophy seems to be based upon the premise that pain and suffering is necessary to build a meaningful life. Yep. Yet the title of your first book is The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. Yep. I think, I feel, and I could be wrong, it should be retitled as the not-so-subtle art of actually giving an F. <laughs> I'm just confused here. Please, if you I, clarify I understand. that point. So, I talk about this in the first chapter, which is one of the first things I talk about in the book, is that you have to give an F about something. We all, you have to. It's impossible to not give an F about something. And so, the question isn't about not learning how to not give an F. It's about finding the right things to give an F about. Um, and, and I understand the confusion, uh, trust me, a lot of people. And, and the reason is, is, is the book kind of, it's designed to trick the reader. Because I think most people, they're stressed out, they're anxious, they're worried, they see the book, they're like, oh man, I wish I didn't give an F, and so they buy it. They're like, yeah, this is great, I'm gonna finally like, just don't care what the world thinks, I'm gonna do what I want. And then you start reading and you're like, oh, oops. <laughs> uh, because ultimately, the book is about values. And it's, it's all of the language, the give and F language, it's, it's a way to kind of trick 
or seduce the reader into thinking about their own values. Because if I title the book, Why Values Are Important, you know, like nobody's going to read that. <laughs> nobody's going to read that. But when you call it the subtle art of not giving it enough, everybody, you know, it, 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 exactly, exactly. All right. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, is it Paul 4, booth 3? Paul 4, H3, Dar al Tanweer. Uh, I'll be signing books in about 15, 20 minutes there, so please stop by. Thank you.